first of all, thanks to the organizer, Joy and Hannah and Balu, for this wonderful meeting. I've learned so much from it. I was asked to speak on whether is, is India ready for AI and health and what is our way forward. This is a very difficult subject to talk about because it involves talking about India in the future. As some of you may remember about India, India is a country where both a statement and its opposite can both be true. So you should only trust about 50% of what I say. There's a 50% chance that what I say will be correct in another 5 or 10 or 20 years. You should keep that in mind. I want you to remember one particular sentence that I've always found very useful in thinking about what long-term impacts are, and that's we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run, whether it's machine learning, deep learning, whatever you want to call it, and to underestimate it in the long run. Already, sort of subtly, whenever you pick up a phone to talk to a customer service agent, you're more likely than not already interacting with some form of AI at the other end, even though you may not know it, though it may sound like a real voice at the end. That shift has already happened and will presumably continue to happen in the future. You may not notice other impacts in your life right now, but certainly this is the direction in which things go. So it's important to remember this particular point, that do not overestimate it now, but don't make, the, 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 don't make the mistake of underestimating what might happen in the future. The second thing I want you to remember is, or just think about, is this face. So this is someone who potentially I could have photographed on, you know, coming back, coming from Chennai to Velour two days ago in, in, uh, in, in the, from the car. So it's an Indian face. Interesting thing is it doesn't exist. There's no such person. This is AI created. And in this version of the AI, you can say, I want a gender of a specific type, I want an age of a specific range, I want an ethnicity, which I choose to be Indian, and gender. So this website is called thispersondoesnotexist.com. An earlier version of this site, in fact, didn't allow you this choice. It just generated large numbers of faces for you that were fairly generic. They could have come from anywhere, South America, the continent, etc. But now you can see that the, the precision with which they're able to generate faces that correspond to a specific ethnicity, age, etc., has now increased over a period of barely about two to three years. So I want to come back to this particular picture, to thinking about this picture a little later when I talk about something else, but let's just go on from now. So when we talk about health data, there's a whole sort of, all of you have spoken about various parts of this, about assimilating parts of this into models, health conditions, reproductive outcomes, causes of death, the quality of life, as well as clinical metrics, including scans of various sorts, environmental, socioeconomic, and behavioral information that are pertinent to health and wellness. We have not spoken so much in this meeting about behavioral outcomes, economics, etc., but they're also part of how, of, of a general picture of how someone responds to treatment, someone responds to, to, to conditions that they have. The records of services received, this is what hospitals keep track of, conditions of these services, and clinical outcomes and further information regarding these services. So most of the talks that have dealt with with, uh, with health data, have talked about different parts of this particular description. There have been another set of talks that have talked about machine learning, and as, as has been emphasized repeatedly, this is the use of data and algorithms to imitate the way that humans actually think, so to look at the way humans perceive patterns, and to try and imitate that, or even generate patterns in other ways. And so that's, that's a machine learning part, but these two are technically separate questions. So even though this meeting is called the National Symposium on Health Data and Artificial Intelligence, it's a, they, they are really questions of, first of all, a lot of attention we've devoted to data, this cleaning up of data, the systematization, privacy concerns, access concerns, cross-platform use, the use of multimodal data that come from a single patient, telemedicine, APIs, et cetera. But the second questions that other people have addressed is what can be done once you have this data using AI techniques or machine learning techniques. Many people have discussed many different strands, EMRs, privacy and consent, machine learning methods, et cetera. So the question is, can we put all of the discussion together in some very high level sense to ask what might happen in the future? As I said, don't believe only 50% of what I say. I have a 50% chance of getting it right at the end. That I don't think there's anyone who would claim to a better number than that. But what I want to do is to describe to you what the issues are so that we can think about them together and see where they're actually leading us. So I want to talk about two things. One is data and AI, where are we, which is uh, the topic of this that I was given. And the second is something that people have not spoken about so far, which is the role of basic science and models specifically in attacking a different set of questions than have been addressed so far. I want to tell you what we've been thinking about them, 
what our work has been along. And these will be somewhat different. The language will be slightly different from the language that you've seen so far. But I want to suggest that these are other ways in which one can think about data, large amounts of data, and be able to assimilate them into first models and then later into predictions at a different scale from the one that has been discussed until now. So let's talk about data itself. And remember, this is part of a worldwide push towards making health data digital as a first step towards proper electronic medical records. And the national health stack in India is thought of as a public good for people to use in the furtherance of our health outcomes. So here's a picture that sort of describes different layers of, of, of data. The first is digitization, where you have already hospitals such as CMC have large amounts of analog data handwritten prescriptions, et cetera, which have to be converted into digital form. So that's the first digitization step, OCR step, for example. The second step is digitalization, taking digital records, combining multiple types of digital records, telehealth consultation, mobile health, EHRs, et cetera, et cetera, and constructing workflows that point them all together into a direction of the national health stack. The national health stack is, of course, connected to various other limbs, the universal payment user interface where you can pay for treatments that you receive, tests that you take, as well as a parallel digital construction of where your health records impact other parts of your life. And all of this relies on constructing a unique identifier for every person who uses a health service. So that's the job of the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission, which changed names at least once in between. The National Digital Health Authority was approved in May 2020. It thinks of digital health as a public good and tries to construct a national digital health ecosystem in the broader sense. As I said, it also includes its part, insurance is part of it, payments is part of it, identifiers are part of this. All of this comes together, which qualifies it to be an ecosystem rather than just a standalone service. So the ABHA number, which is the, the single number that, that characterizes that is unique to every user, is part of that, the Unified Health Interface, the Healthcare Professionals Registry, which was spoken about yesterday, the ABHA mobile app, the Health Facility Registry, all of these are part of the generic ecosystem that has been constructed around this question of, 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 um, this, this, this question of, of the ecosystem that we discussed. So what are the numbers? By the 28th of February 2023, that's about a few weeks ago, we had about 25 crore health records of individuals linked to the ABHA, which is the Ayushman Bharat Health Account for in-time access. And this is from a press release taken at that time. And just to, for the conversion for people who are unfamiliar with the Indian crores, 34 crores is 340 million. 340 million is about the, the, the population of the United States. So that's roughly where we are. We're in, in terms of numbers, that's a very impressive number to start out with. Yesterday, that is March 17th, that number stood at 34 crores, or 340, 343 million. So we've already seen a jump of something like four, about, about 9 million, just over that period, about two to three weeks. Okay, so that tells you a little bit about the pace at which this is happening. This should be compared to the population of India, which is about 140 odd crores. So we are already looking at a fairly large number, a fairly large fraction at that, in terms of comparison. Where was this data obtained? So here is the different sources of the data. COVIN was one, the, the vaccination app. The PMJ, the insurance, app, the insurance schemes of the government. BIS, the government of Andhra Pradesh also seems to have done a good job in enrollment under the ABHA. COVIN contributes 12 crores, 37 lakhs, 48,000, et cetera, et cetera. And PMJ about 5 lakhs, 92,000. So the larger contributor to this is COVIN. And if, if you look at 34, at, at 34 crores, 12 crores is about around 30 to 35% of that number. The question is, where did this come from? And there was a lot of, if you, if you remember these, the uh, question was, did you agree to create a health ID via the Aadhaar? The government claims that you did. And then other reports said that you took the COVID vaccine using Aadhaar. Your national health ID has been created without your permission. So that raises an interesting question. Essentially, all of this data was sort of sucked up from people who were being vaccinated and used to create a health ID, presumably, at least in, in my guess is a majority of those cases, without explicit consent. Again, sort of to, to, to go back to this particular statement, which is also fairly characteristic of all such identifiers, that the creation of the health ID and the participation in the NDHM is purely voluntary for every individual, and the government does not intend to make it mandatory. Again, it's a press release from the government. So this raises interesting questions about privacy. I mean, we've all been talking about privacy in the context of hospitals, of, of, of healthcare systems that are local and private. But what happens if the government sucks out your data and then tells you that, no, no, we thought you consented in the first place? And in this case, that, that's again a question, do, do governments have that right? 
and to what extent do we consider this as well as part of the privacy that you're entitled to as a citizen? Can we issue a healthy ID to all? Well, the numbers already enrolled, as I said, is 37 crores, total population is 140 crores. This is a bridgeable gap. We've been doing fairly well. It should be possible in principle, given these numbers, given the rate of enrollment, to ensure that every Indian within a year to two has a digital ID, a national health ID. Okay? So just reasoning from numbers, growth rates, et cetera, this is, this is not impossible. Are there incentives to do this? Remember that 70% of Indians go to private health providers, many of them informal health providers, and ranging from high-end private hospitals to traditional healers down the road. So you might ask what nudges might work in this case, because again, if it's not mandatory to have this, and the government says it's not mandatory, you have to nudge people in the right direction to do this, and nudging is a complicated social phenomenon. What induces a user to say that, look, I would like to register for this? What can the government do, if not mandate it, to encourage people to sign up for it? What can organizations such as CMC do, for example? Of course, we're also cognizant of the problem that Aadhaar created, and I was particularly aware of this when I took my mother for some bank work and found that she couldn't register her, her, her fingerprint at, at age 84. And we spent a frustrating 45 minutes just pressing on that thing, trying to get this. And you know, you, this, these are questions that were spoken about yesterday as well. And, and the fact that you know, digital divides are complex. I mean, you would not imagine that, that an educated woman in a, in a metropolitan city would face the same sort of issues as someone very far away in, in, in for example, in rural Odisha or in areas that are not well served. But again, when one constructs these large governmental schemes that enroll people and make them make certain benefits conditional on that enrollment, that's when you begin to have problems. Okay, so given, so let's just change track a little bit and come back to what people have been talking about, which is given patient data, where does AI enter? And all the discussion so far has really been on looking at individual level tools for clinicians. Look at a scan, look at an x-ray, look at a CT scan, et cetera, and decide what stage, what, what is the survival of this patient after one year, after two years, et cetera. And this has been emphasized. You should look at these tools, validate them for your own patient groups. It's not enough to use data from the US or from Europe. And as an aid in clinical decision, these will slowly become more and more important. They already perform very well in comparison to humans, or comparable to or better than, let's just say that, in comparison to humans. They'll only get better, but there are, of course, dangers in trusting it blindly, as have been amply emphasized in the last, over yesterday and today. The reasons, of course, are that it's hard for humans to process very large multimodal data streams. These are things that computers do very well, integrate multiple different types of information, weight them appropriately, in a way that a human cannot. A human may look at the larger, broader picture and maybe assist it or collaborate with machines. And we should also take into account the fact that, as I said, over the somewhat longer term, machine learning methods will improve in very startling ways. And certainly, if you look at chat GPT-3 and chat GPT-4, this is something that was unanticipated about three to four years ago, that you could have essentially machines writing text that would be indistinguishable from an uh, ordinary person writing text. And of course, in chat GP3, they had the problem of machines making up text in a very convincing manner. So the fact that a machine could be lying to you is, I think, something that was novel and came out at the, at the end of chat GP3. And, but hopefully, these are problems that will be solved as we go forward. So getting to a digital health ID for every Indian is feasible. All issues that have been talked about, privacy, security, accessibility, fairness, et cetera, these will remain issues. And these should really now rise to the top of our collective consciousness. How do we ensure fairness in, in, in the ways that we described yesterday? Over-regulation is also a problem as much as inconsistent regulation. And the problem with inconsistent regulation was pointed out yesterday. But also just too much, saying, preventing people from doing anything with the data is also a problem. And therefore, legislation to be constructed to make it reasonably possible for work to proceed with that data that in a true sense benefits communities, benefits patients at large without layering it with so many restrictions and difficulties that that becomes impossible. These are larger questions of who owns data, who should be shared, et cetera. Data doesn't fit typical principles of private ownership, excludability, rivalry between individuals, but it clearly fits principles of privacy and limitations on use. And to, to the right principles of governance for data should be about promoting sharing for allowed use by limiting privacy breaches and misuse of that data. And I like this point that was made yesterday by Andre about the fact that what you want to do is to ensure that it's not misused. And that is, that is a sort of to, to penalize misuse of data rather than restrict the use of data, which is probably a different way of, of, con of configuring this, of thinking about it. But I think that's the right way to proceed. 
So will AI eliminate the clinician? I don't think so. I don't think that's going to happen. Because also something that's been noticed, for example, when you look at AI playing chess, that the best, uh, the best combinations are humans together with AI, it's not AI alone. And the combination of a human intelligence with a machine intelligence, the human moderating, asking further questions, checking up, checking, keeping a check on what the machine is doing, is probably optimal. And I think still the relationship between a doctor, a clinician, and a patient is still very central to the patient's experience and very central to wellness. This is something we've become increasingly unused to in the last couple of years. There was a time I remember when doctors would come home. That never happens anymore. But that, you know, to, to reconstruct a relationship that works at a psychological level as well for the patient, I think is where we may be moving to in the future and using every digital tool that's there at our disposal. Okay, I want to now talk about something else. And so far, as I said, we've concentrated on individual health, the health of an individual patient. And what is it that AI, ML, I mean, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, deep, deep learning is a subset of machine intelligence. So I will use the words AI, ML somewhat interchangeably. So we've, we had, the idea typically there is to go from a large data set that you constantly add to, that is curated, et cetera, to make individual predictions for patients. But public health and epidemiology, which deals with populations and not with individuals, are also important, as we know from our last three and a half years experience with COVID. Can data and machine learning methods help there in that particular area? And this is not something that has been dealt with in the discussions earlier. Typically, the, the line between data and the output of artificial intelligence or machine learning program is not necessarily interpretable. There are versions of AI that give you, that say, this is why the machine learning technique gave you this particular answer. But most of it, it's really a black box. Typically, deep learning methods don't tell you how they arrived at that answer. They just work. And sometimes they work spectacularly. But also, when they go wrong, they go wrong spectacularly. So it's a, it's, it's a fine line there to actually think about this. So I want to suggest that one intermediary is to work with models that sit somewhere between the data and the AI output and look at how models can be constructed that don't have the difficulties of AI. For example, fairness questions of what you train your, your data on. Remember that the quality of data and the training data that is supplied and all the biases that exist in that data will be reflected in the output of your AI or machine learning. So if you, train, if you train your data on white Caucasian populations, there's no guarantee that it will work on black populations. If you train it exclusively on men, the women's physiology are somewhat different in crucial ways. There's no guarantee that it will work there. So you have to customize. The data has to be drawn from the sources that you want to study. And that's particularly important. That's not guaranteed in general. With a model, you can be sure that you've, you've constructed it to be neutral to these biases, or as neutral as you can actually make it to these biases. So that's an interesting area to think about. Let me give you one example. If you have clinical data that is a combination of, machine, of, of mobile health monitors, clinical reports, et cetera, et cetera, you can look at mechanistic models, for example, heart function that you calibrate, optimize, further, et cetera, et cetera, and the process of induction and deduction based on those models. You can also look at statistical models that take that data and look at the output that arise out of that. In general, this should lead to better clinical predictions and interpretability, but it's just that these are much more complicated to deal with because the appropriate model in many cases is not known. It's known in some cases, but not known in some other cases. The advantage, of course, is that you can include other types of data into this particular description. For example, epigenomics, microbiome, metabolome, et cetera, all of which are known to be important to health but they can also be factored in into these decisions. It's not just looking at a set of CT scan images, but a broader integrative approach that integrates multiple types of data together. In general, biological systems, physiological systems are too complex and too poorly understood to be fully represented digitally. But you can also look at specific organ systems now in increasing detail and hopefully make some progress with that. And I think that's an important direction to take, and that's a scientific direction. And as much as we look at data and look at the machine learning, computer science directions, we must also look at scientific directions and see where they actually meet together. So if you want to look at rare diseases, it's good to look at very specific populations that are highly inbred, so they maintain the genetic purity. So the Avasta Genome Project looks at the Parsi genome. The Parsi are a highly inbred population. And looking at rare diseases when that will tell us a lot about how these diseases might be represented in populations outside the Parsi community. So that's, again, one example of how you can look at data and then extend its validity to a larger sense from a scientific point of view. So my own interests are in epidemiology and social, more recently, social determinants of disease. I want to tell you a little bit about that and why this is interesting as a question. And then we can ask, how do you use AI and models to address, in quotes, what I call a wicked problem. The word wicked problem came up yesterday 
So let me just describe what a wicked problem is. A wicked problem is a problem that is challenging or impossible to solve, either because not enough have understood about it, the number of stakeholders involved, the number of varying opinions, the economic burden, or the impact of these problems with other problems. So these are problems that are, everyone agrees are very, very difficult because they're extremely complex. Many things have to work together, and we don't even know at the end what is a good solution. There may be an okay solution, or for now, a solution that we can manage, but it's not necessarily the best solution. It's not even clear what the best solution actually is to a wicked problem. So let's go back to the pandemic. And you, you know that the pandemic increased both economic and health inequalities. The wealthy were able to keep well-paid jobs, but also benefited from stock markets that went up and rising house prices. So inequality, which is spoken of yesterday, is, was also a feature of this. It's, the pandemic exacerbated inequality that already existed in our society. Low-paid workers were more likely to have jobs in sectors that suspended activities, for example, the hospitality sector and the tourism sector. They were also more likely to work in essential services, nursing, policing, teaching, all of which involved much more person-to-person -person contact. So they all had a higher likelihood of developing of being exposed to COVID-19. And add to that crowded home conditions, living in more crowded homes, being more reliant on public transport, you automatically have a further exacerbation of pre-existing inequalities that come when COVID-19 actually spread. And this is a social phenomenon. The disease remains the same. It's just that this subset of the population suffers more than another subset of the population. As far as the clinician is concerned, whether you treat a poor person or the pre or, or, or rich person, you use the same treatment to whatever exists. You provide the same steroidal treatments in, in, in addition for this. But the social components of the disease is important to understand, to understand how it spreads within a population. Are we going to have 100 cases tomorrow, 1,000 cases tomorrow, 5,000 cases tomorrow? Where will those cases come? from. These are questions that public health specialists and epidemiologists are very concerned with that are one step beyond the impact of the disease on a specific individual. In India, of course, there's rural, urban, north, south, caste, accessibility, traditional medicine use versus, versus allopathic medicine, trust in government as an important determinant to whether you get vaccinated or not. All of these factors are important in determining the interaction between society and, um, and, the health, and people using the health system. So I want to talk a little bit about the use of models here. And this is a model that we worked on, where we looked at each individual district of, of Andhra Pradesh and looked at the, at, the, at the shape of the epidemic, make projections for the epidemic across basically between the delta wave and the, and, 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 and the, the later wave, the first wave and the second wave. We made weekly projections across a certain period here, and really concentrating on numbers of predicted hospitalizations and the amount of drugs that had to be procured for treatment. But this lacks the sort of granularity that you might really want. What you might want to know is within a city, within wards in a city, within sub-wards within those wards, what might be the expected case and how do social determinants interact with that? These are questions that are really public health questions at their core. They're not questions about individuals, but if you want to ask broader population-based public health questions, this is what you need to be doing. So let's ask this question. Suppose I gave you every bit of information about, let's say, everybody in this room, you know, your height, your weight, when you were born, where you work, your income, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Would that be enough for me? Your, any pre-existing condition that you might have, your general state of health, your pulse rate, et cetera, et cetera. If I had that information, I would presumably be in a better position to make a decision regarding what I know, given what I know about the impact of COVID-19, that I can extract from multiple types of data from across the world. But what about privacy? I've taken very private information from you in order to be able to say something about how the disease might involve you. But suppose instead what I could do would to replace that information that I might get directly from you by an equivalent information that reproduces everybody in this room, not exactly, but statistically. And I want to go back to that picture that I showed. That picture is, the picture that I showed you earlier is not a picture of a real person, remember that. But it's an exceptionally accurate description of a person. In principle, this is a person you could see on the road outside. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But that's a made-up person. So can you take data and make up synthetic data that has all the properties of the population that you might want to study, except that no data point corresponds to a real person at all. So therefore, you cannot go back. There is no person on a one-to-one -one basis for which you can say that this computer person is the person where I originated from. So this is the idea of thinking of individuals as agents and taking agents as, this, the word that is used is agent. These, these simulations based on agents are called agent-based simulations. Extract from these, from your description of your population, those attributes that are relevant to disease and public health. 
And then essentially, so here's your, that face again. And this picture is, is, is a picture of one of someone I would call an agent. There's no person who corresponds to that, but the features are all believable. So any attribute to this agent, as I said, we already were able to layer on a multiple attributes to this person. We put an age, we put an age range, we put a, a, an, an ethnic origin, et cetera, et cetera. But you can imagine making more and more detailed specifications of that. So something I've been working on, which is called the Bharatsam program, is an ultra-large scale simulation of agents with properties that are derived from, from a synthetic population. Synthetic means it's sort of made up in this sense. So it's, you can simulate, we can simulate somewhere between, you know, anywhere between 50, 100, 500 agents to about 50 million agents. And the size of a city like Bombay is about 12 to 14, 15 million. So it's about, you can get to about the medium-sized city. Kerala is about 35 million. So you can s simulate somewhere around one state. With, with, with that. And there's an underlying geography derived from a GIS. It's, it's, it's a synthetic population for regions. And there's a visualization tool, there's a simulation framework, etc. So you can study communities, you can study districts, you can study states, and all of these uh, correspond to different questions. With communities, you might want to ask, can we open schools now or not? For districts, you might want to ask, should we have a localized lockdown or not? What are statewide measures, et cetera? So now you can look at ways to target interventions in a much more local manner than you were able to do in an earlier case. So this is Pune City, when you, where the, the, the uh, infectious disease is spreading between day 21 and day 42. And here's a bunch of data sources for this. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So that's Pune City on the left, showing how disease is spreading across different years, ward-wise. So each of those colors corresponds to a different ward. There's a movie here, which will probably not show up because it's, not, it's, a, it's a PDF on this. The data that defines the synthetic population is drawn from a variety of sources. So one is the gridded population of the world that across one kilometer by one kilometer provides you estimates of what the population is there. The IHDS survey, the Census of India, the Ministry of, the, of, of um, Program Implementation, et cetera, all of these. Basically, you combine the results of multiple surveys together in order to generate a realistic looking synthetic population. So this would be the workflow. I don't want to spend time on this. These are just technical details, but there's a geographical data pipeline, there's gridded population, there's a base population with demographic data. And finally, what you have is essentially one huge file where every line corresponds to one person, and that file has something like 200 different columns. And you can combine data in multiple ways to achieve that. You can then combine it to actual data that is known and see how well you do. And usually the difficulty is not so much looking at just distribution of heights, distribution of weights, et cetera, but making sure that the height and weight go together. And that's where you have correlated variables because someone who is, who is you know, five foot six inches cannot be two kilos in weight. They have to be somewhere more reasonable in that. So it's these descriptions of these correlations where machine learning enters. And that's we use um, adversarial networks in order to do that part of it. So a combination of these multiple surveys, adversarial networks that are trained on survey populations that allow you to generate this. We can make schools, we can make households. We, if you had exact data for locations, we could just put the exact data in. But for now, given a certain density of schools, we can actually put that information from the outside. So we can do various things with it. And, you know, I'm, I'm, this is not the most interesting thing in general for a population, but you can say if I had one variant following another variant, and the second variant, in, and being infected with the first variant gave you 50% or 40% protection against infection by the second, what would you expect the, the rise of cases to be in the second variant? If you had a vaccination program that came in at day 20 or day 50 or day 100, et cetera, after the initiation of the pandemic, what effect would that have even if you had 100% reinfection? So right now, doing anything with COVID-19 COVID in India is very complicated because everybody has had an individual different trajectory. Some people have had been infected by Omicron, but not by Delta, by Delta and by Omicron, Delta, Omicron, and XBB after that. So this becomes a much more complicated issue that's harder to do, but in a more pristine setting, where it's very clear what variant followed what, and there isn't a zoo of variants, it's easy to do things like this and decide even locally what you can actually do. So this, in a sense, is... I said the synthetic population is created by these methods, is supplemented by simulations. These are new approaches to epidemiology that use computers and machine learning to push new directions here. But you can also put in social determinants, and that's a fun thing. You can put in the fact that different areas of the city are, have different populations, that contacts between people are different. For example, if you had contacts, if you tended to contact your own socioeconomic group more than others, or your own caste group more than others, you can put that into that. And you're completely fiddling around with synthetic populations. You're not doing anything that reflects the true underlying thing. You're not violating anyone's privacy at all. Yet you're able to make important epidemiological statements, public health statements, by reaching a situation where the population that you're working with is as close in spirit 
the original population that you wanted to start out with. So this is a wicked problem, as I said. Thinking about social determinants of disease is among the wickedest of problems. But here's one way of thinking about it that combines many of the things we've been talking about. Data, integrating data, replacing data by synthetic data, using machine learning methods to perform this integration that keeps these variables together, and finally doing something with it in terms of a, of, of, of a model. The real reason to do this is that you can do things with this that you cannot do with machine learning with models. For example, I can shut down I can sh shut down all schools in my computer model within a particular ward. I can shut them down in Chennai, in Chennai but not in Velour. Or I can shut it down in Alvarpet but not in Ananagar. I can reduce transport. I can say that I will have buses plying only between 12, 12 noon and 4 in the afternoon. I can do anything I want. I can say that, look, I'm doing vaccinations here and vaccinations here. These things with a good model that is trained properly can actually push you somewhat further. You can do things that you cannot do with standard machine learning. And so in a sense, this is a parallel approach to thinking about difficult problems, also all involving public health. And this, I think, is an interesting thing to think about in general, what the scope of these new methods are. Yeah, these are old pictures from the sort of, as I said, social determinants of disease. This is the line of people during the lockdown, people going back, in many cases, walking hundreds of kilometers back home. And again, this is a quote from the people who originally thought about wicked problems. And I wanted to spend a bit of time on that. In a pluralistic society, there's nothing like the undisputable public good. No objective definition of equity. Policies that respond to social problems cannot be meaningfully correct or false. Just the question of did the lockdown, did the lockdown save lives, did it not save lives? What sort of lives did it save? What was the quality of life that it led to? Did it leave people worse off than they were in the beginning? All these depend upon definitions of worse off, what you think about. There's no universal answer to any of There are no solutions in the sense of definition of an objective answer. Okay, so having depressed you all now completely with this particular statement, bridging the digital divide is extremely important. I've said that we can easily get to, to 140 crores within the next year or two, but you know, to what level of agency are you going to provide those 140 crores? You may have dealt with people who are aligned with the medical system well enough and trust it enough to get vaccinated twice and get a booster shot and thereby figure in the Aadhaar to, to, the, to, to the ABBA ID transition. But the people who are left over are people who don't necessarily trust the system well enough. Why should they do this? Even if you gave them a card, what do they do with it? What do they use of this? How do you make sure that they do not suffer? And let me sort of finally finish up with these two quotes which I think are really important. First, you know, you don't, don't overestimate it now. There are certain things that it can do, but it's getting better. But do not underestimate what it can lead to in the long term. The second is this quote from yesterday, that, you know, who's all this for? And that's something that we, that we shouldn't forget. It's, it's really people who are well off, higher socioeconomic classes, etc. they have options. But by introducing our com complex health architectures, you must ensure that everyone profits. And it's really, if you can ensure that the, mo that the poorest and the most deprived profit, then automatically everybody above that will, will do fine. That's something to, to actually remember, and that's all I had to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Gautam, for that uh, enlightening uh, keynote address. Uh, we do have time to take one or two questions. I'll start with the first one. Uh, so in the ICMR guideline that was recently released, uh, it talks about human in the loop uh, system uh, of AI for uh, healthcare. Uh, is, does that mean that it completely excludes uh, deep learning algorithms? And if so, if the AI malfunctions in some way, uh, uh, what are the current uh, mechanisms in place uh, to um, who is responsible and how do we adjudicate uh, whether the designer is responsible or the developer or the institution which has bought the AI or the healthcare provider? What kind of transparency uh, is presently available and what is a mandate on the ethics committee to ensure it? Oh, that's a hard question. I think at least to the, to, um, to the first point, which was, which was about? The uh, human in the loop. But I, so I, I think that just says that do not just blindly take an AI prediction or AI machine learning prediction and use it on the patient without human intervention at that point to make sure that this is consistent at least with the broad body of, of clinical knowledge at that point and what is known. That the clinician is aware of proper treatment options and is, can, can concur with, with what the AI is actually saying. It's not at vast divergence with what the AI is actually saying. Regarding the second point, who, who accepts the blame, that's a hard question because you can always argue that there's always somebody else to assign the blame to the people who collected the data, 
who might have had gaps in the data or collected it incorrectly, are they responsible? Are the people who did the machine learning but imputed data values in some way that was incorrect, are they responsible? Are, is the algorithm responsible? I don't think there's a very clear distinction there. And I think the first part of it, that humans must be involved in decision making at the final stage, that's the important thing to ensure. And above, above and beyond that, I think in general, community evaluation and standards and stand, the standardization of AIs that are used, I think is also important. And meetings like this will go a long way towards clarifying those particular issues. Thank you. There's one question, Dr. Balu. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we heard about federated learning earlier, which actually uh, reduces restrictions and in improves fair data usage. So how do you think uh, data, for example, CMC is 22 years of data. Uh, how can it contribute to developing a synthetic data set? You spoke about public health uh, synthetic data. So how does it, can this be translated to something similar? It can, and, and the federated model would be the best way of doing it so that we don't see what data that you have, and we can sort of mangle the data, and we can also check that there is no individual, you cannot make the connection. Computer scientists will argue about this a lot, saying that you can always, given you can always figure out where the person, but given these methods, I don't think you can, given the combination of machine learning methods that are applied to the data. So the federated model would be the right model to use. It ensures that we are completely insulated from looking at the data altogether. Thank you. We can take one more question. We have Burgess, who was a winner of the Kahoot yesterday. So, uh, you want to pass on the question to him? Okay, fine. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a point that I want to pick up. Uh, what Dr. Menon had brought up. This has been in my mind since the evening. Uh, this is about applying AI at the population level data, right? So, could that potentially answer the digital divide? Can it reduce the inequalities where we have? And also, have there been some examples on that of using AI at the population level data or population level, uh, population at population levels is itself something that I wanted to ask Andre as well, uh, you know. So, Andre so, may have another answer to this. Certainly for yeah. COVID-19, there were some good models that were, that were AI, that were machine learning based and some that were spectacularly bad. So, they were completely, they, they predicted a huge peak in last year in, in May, June, which never actually happened. So it's, it's a sort of tricky situation over there regarding the predictions of that. I don't think that that solves the digital divide problem. The digital divide really is an individual problem. It's not a, it's not a collective problem. It's the fact that individuals, depending upon where they are, depending upon their background, may not be able to access health services using the, the, using the digital IDs to its complete value. In fact, the digital ID may be a barrier to their accessing it. But it's an individual problem. It's not a collective in the sense that I'm describing it. It's not a population level problem. Yeah, uh, so my question is, you know, what we learn at the population levels, can it sort of come back into the system Reducing that divide is what it, I'm more it, like, like it to It could. Make. So if you have yeah. a good synthetic population, you can argue that, look, I'm going to try and target those elements in my synthetic population in these regions who, are, who I believe will be underserved because of the socioeconomic status or caste status, or whatever it is historically, whatever might have led to that happening. That relies on a good synthetic population, which itself relies, relies on good data that is collected. So data is paramount. Clean data is important. Yeah. Once you do that, you can actually do this particular target. You can see who might be vulnerable communities. Can you ensure that they are treated well and, and trained or, or taught how to use these methods if that's the direction in which we're going to go? Globally? Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Menon. Yeah. Dr. Burgess. Thank you. So I have a follow-up question on Vadarajan's, which is interesting he went first. Um, so, yeah, so my background is in community medicine and in health informatics, and we've been into the field. We've interacted with ASHA's a &Ms, uh, and people from that kind of background in terms of how they're able to handle apps. So we've seen the digital divide and we've been talking about it uh, yesterday and today. So do you have any uh, insights on how do we go about addressing it once we've identified where the gaps are? Um, what can be done? Uh, I know this is, may not be exactly what uh, you came to share with us, but we'd be really interested to know what can we do about the digital divide? I wish I knew. I mean, this is not, I mean, there are people here in this audience who know much more about this. What I think good synthetic populations can do is help you together with surveys identify people. After that is the question of state intervention, NGO intervention in particular ways to make sure that, 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 that those interventions reach the target population. Already there, we're making a step forward, saying that, look, I can tell you across the country, if I have a good enough synthetic population, 
not just in this particular taluk or this particular region here, but I have a global picture of what might be happening. I will know, I can then measure the resources that are involved, figure out how much money needs to be sent, who figure out how much manpower needs to be trained in order to do that. These larger questions one can do if one has a good synthetic population. But the more micro questions, I don't know. You're, all of you are more, probably more, more um, you know, uh, have thought about it more and are able to understand what might be the right interventions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll give one more round of applause for this uh, great lecture.